Hi there. We just got leaked photos from the makeup department revealing that the White Walkers will reappear on screen in House of the Dragon Season 2, which raises all sorts of questions about what exactly would they be doing in this prequel era, the specific time period of the Dance of the Dragons, and touches on other questions of why did they return after 8,000 years and the gap between those. Now, I made a shorter 15-minute video edited with images to catch people's attention. This is the long-form, audio-only podcast. The only way I could get it done in a reasonable amount of time is if I do it audio-only, just unedited, think of it as a live stream. But I have scripted it out with four single-spaced pages going over all of the specific details. This is the hardcore, detailed version for the book an book analysts of everything we know about the White Walkers in this time period. Like, I already did one of these on everything we know about the Night's Watch in this time period, but that was pretty straightforward. I read through Fire and Blood and said, what can we extrapolate about their numbers, which castles are still active in this time that were later closed? The White Walkers is a bigger thing. But then someone recommended me to watch a video series Preston Jacobs did five years ago, analyzing why are the White Walkers coming back and actually going over the what they were doing in prior time periods. And some people go, oh, well, it's, it's such an obvious theory, it, it's almost a cliché. Well, you know how Martin's the guy going, I'm not going to change plot mysteries when people start guessing them by book six out of seven? Because certain things will logically start converging, like... If the evidence by the final act of a movie is that the butler did it, the murder, you don't change it because subvert expectations. You know, the whole, they were setting up Jon Snow as the Chosen One, panicked when it became obvious by the final season out of eight, then said, uh, uh, make Arya do it, it's, it's too predictable. Or, or that Jamie would kill Cersei, I think, they thought was predictable. So if anything, Preston's analysis of this is kind of obvious. Uh, to some, some people accuse it of being obvious, so this is sort of an introduction for everyone, but I'm updating what, I agreed with everything Preston did in his analysis, and I'm updating it with stuff we found out from House of the Dragon, with a specific eye towards what were they doing in the Dance of the Dragons era, around the year 130 after Conquest. Uh, the specific video series Preston did, I'm going to link this in the description box below and at the end, was it was the White Walkers and Craster's Keep. The mysteries of Craster and how he originated, how other things tied in for why he was there in the first place. If you only watch one, because it's a multi-part, five-part series, specifically skip ahead to part three. I'm linking to part three, which is when he really goes over not just part one and two are about Craster, part three is about what led up to Craster. All the stuff from before the, between the Long Night and Jon Snow's time, that's what part three was covering. So I agreed with all of it, and just some of these things really stood out to me, and with my own research, and what this was five years ago, what we found out from House of the Dragon tying in with that. So, what were the White Walkers doing all this time? Why are they coming back after 8,000 years? And how can House of the Dragon tie in with this in a way that isn't just gratuitous fan service, but there's, like, a lore reason for this? I talked about this in my shorter video, that, like, Season 1, revealing Aegon's prophecy that he had prophetic dream. the whole reason he united the Seven Kingdoms and made the Iron Throne is he had a prophetic dream the White Walkers were going to return. That actually adds to the lore and is a central thing in Season 1 of House of the Dragon, but it wasn't just a shameless cameo. It added to things. So, introduction, what is the theory that Preston articulated, which it'll, I don't know if he was the one who originated it or he really laid it out very clearly, of what the only thing the book fandom can think of for why they're coming back now, which the TV show never tried to address, and like I said... After Season 6, they gave us no revelations about the White Walkers whatsoever, other than that they're generic demons. You know, that they're this apocalyptic threat. You got no plot answers after that straight-up Hodor reveal. And again, I hate it when people, like, attribute book things to the genius of Benioff and Weiss. Like, they're so genius, they killed Ned Stark and made the Red Wedding. 
because they were doing something Martin told them, or the Hodor reveal they admitted, oh, that's something Martin thought up. Well, then you at best executed it well, but it's not, you're right, that people can't, even in the first through fourth season, couldn't distinguish, they didn't make this story. So it was nice, that was a book theory for a while, that the White Walkers were created by the Children of the Forest. Uh, after that reveal, we learned nothing about, well, why are they coming back now? So, that out of the way, the theory is, there's three points here. Point one, the Night's Watch may have always been providing b male babies to the White Walkers as sacrifices. Like what Craster was doing, but on a larger scale. And at first we thought, oh, Mormont and the other, he said all of the Rangers, including Benjen, knew that Craster was sacrificing babies. And maybe they didn't believe in the White Walkers, I think some of them did, but... They knew he was sacrificing babies, but okay, this is the era of the decline of the Night's Watch, where they do not have the luxury of picking and choosing their allies. That They hate Craster, but they, they said, well, we need him to have an outpost out here. He's meant the difference between life and death for a lot of rangers. Theory is, no, even since the beginning, right after the Long Night, when they built the Wall, when the Night's Watch was at the height of its power, thousands of years ago, they were always providing male babies to the White Walkers, not just setting up wildlings like Craster to provide them, but delivering them from the Wall itself because of the mysterious Black Gate at the Night Fort. Point two of three, obviously this is an all-male military order and they need a lot of excess babies that people don't want. So point two, the theory is that the tradition of first night among the first men may have been set up as a pipeline for producing unwanted babies from rape. That uh, the tradition of first night is that a lord has the right to have sex with a commoner woman on the first night of her marriage. And they said that it was a first men tradition. It generally fell out of favor. It, it was around a little, but the Andal kingdoms of the south stopped doing it so much. But even in later ages, it was still mostly done in the lands closer to the wall. You know, that that's probably not an accident. In secret, there's this whole thing in Book 5 where Roose Bolton explains this to Theon and scoffs at, oh, they still do that close to there. and Because, you know, Roose produced Ramsay Bolton as a product of he raped a commoner woman on her wedding night, even though he knows First Night is illegal now. But he still did it, so... At first, I didn't want them to mention this at all because, you know, the medievalist, the medieval student in me is that First Night was never real in real life. That, that Braveheart popularized that this was a thing. It was never a thing. But in Martin's world, it was. I mean, unambiguously, they say it was. It wasn't banned. It was banned under, around two and a half hundred centuries ago. It, it was a real thing, which is annoying. And at first I thought it was great that Game of Thrones didn't mention it, because it, they do mention Ramsay was a product of rape, but not that, oh, that you, uh, it used to be a law, I'm annoyed they out that they banned. But that might actually tie in with the White Walkers very directly, in which case you would need to mention it in House of the Dragon Season 2. But point one, they've always been sending babies to the White Walkers. Point two, they get these babies from, they got these babies from First Night, producing an a surplus of unwanted babies. Point three, as the theory goes, when the early Targaryen kings banned First Night and shut down the Night Fort, where these transactions probably took place, it cut off the supply. Specifically, this ban was made by King Jaehaerys and Queen Alysanne around the year 60 after Conquest. Remember, we saw Jaehaerys in the prologue of House of the Dragon, in his youth. At this, it would have been about uh, 40 years before the prologue and 70 years before Season 2. This double decision that we're going to ban First Night, and, oh, by the way, the Night Ford is too big to maintain, and it's crumbling. You should shut it down, that the real reason was it was... Be There's this secret tunnel used for child sacrifices. So the combined effect of all of this is that the White Walkers might be coming back after 8,000 years, only in the sense that they're coming back in force to attack. 
but not because of something new that happened, but because something stopped. That it's not like, I used to think, oh, maybe like the magic volcano or whatever that they draw their power from like a battery is wearing out. No. The only suggestion I've really seen for why are they coming back that's coherent, that has a specific reason other than something wore out, is something stopped from the south of the wall, that they stopped getting sacrifices. And consider George R. R. Martin's literary influences. It might be a riff on the whole St. George and the Dragon thing, and countless other tales like the Cretan Minotaur and so forth, and various movies adapting these he's a fan of, of how many stories are there, or there's a dragon or another monster that a community regularly placates with human sacrifices until the hero inadvertently unleashes the monster's wrath by saving the damsel who was offered up to it. So that's the first section of this, of just, that's the theory of why they're coming back. The Targaryens stopped the human sacrifices that were going on in secret. And things like Craster among the Wildlings were a stopgap measure desperately trying to placate them, but that, that couldn't match the scale of the child sacrifices they used to get from unwanted babies produced by rape from large sections of Westeros. For, that's first section. Now, moving on, let's update Preston's conclusions from five years ago with what we have confirmed from House of the Dragons revelations. They revealed something we'd speculated, but that Aegon the Conqueror united the Seven Kingdoms and forged the Iron Throne because he had a prophetic dream the White Walkers would return. Martin himself confirmed this in interviews that is not a dimension of the TV show. What if, as so often happens in cases of classical Greek tragedy, in that style, what if the early Targaryens' efforts to prepare Westeros to fight off the White Walkers are what motivated them to prepare a full-scale attack in the first place? That history could have kept trudging on with bastard sons being sacrificed from first night, being sacrificed at the night fort in secret. That could have gone on for centuries. Nothing would have changed. But then Aegon unified Westeros to defend against this coming thing that he unintentionally provoked. And some people in the comments are going to be, oh, the Targaryens caused it. Well, any more than, like, um, Ariadne and Jason, everything, you can't, well, we stopped the sacrifices to the Minotaur, we stopped the sacrifice to the Gorgon, now it's going to come and it, it destroy the city. Well, you provoked it by saying, I'm not going to take part in human sacrifice. Is that really... Th and that's what makes this more than the, Benioff and Weiss's, they're going to kill all humans, they're zombies, as opposed to the moral dilemma which people can debate of, do we sacrifice some to save all? I mean... <sighs> Imagine if aliens were invading, and they said, look, you can't beat us, but we'd lose a few ships attacking you, like in the style of 1996's Independence Day, and they want to eat people. And if they said, hey, can you just give us one of those countries you're not really using, like Turkmenistan, or the Central African Republic, or East Timor, or something, or North Korea... That if we tried to attack the whole planet, we'd lose a few guys, we don't really want to do that. Can you just sacrifice us one of those countries you don't really like, that's like North Korea or something? And the moral dilemma of, do we send people to die for the sake of that? And this comes up, it's really a thematic thing throughout the books if you think about it, of people are okay with sacrificing some at the bottom of the social pyramid to prop up everyone else. I mean, the entire thing is feudalism that the serfs are at the bottom. The extension of that is some unwanted babies are being sacrificed so we all don't get killed. This ties in with it. That's a, a speech Zarazon Daxos gives in Book 5 about justifying slavery, where he goes to Daenerys. Every major civilization in Essos, Westeros is the exception, but the bigger, grander-scale civilizations that, like, built pyramids, built Yeti, built Valyria... Every major civilization in Essos since the dawn of time has been built on the backs of slavery. And it's not this Marxist e utopia that goes, for some of us to be able to be scholars, some have to be 
laborers who were working all the time and in slavery and that's his his worldview on it that well of course we're sacrificing some for the sake of all that's what society is taken to a ridiculous extreme with and it turns out our civilization is propped up with human sacrifice that we didn't tell people about so that that's the whole conundrum or do you think about like that the last of us had that moral uh, quandary of do we kill the one immune girl to harvest her immunity to try to develop a vaccine against the fungal infection that destroyed the world? That should one die so many can live? That, that's a whole theme, as opposed to uh, Season 7, 8 was just, they're zombies, aren't they cool? No, there, there's no story to that. But tying all this, the, the, tra the thing we learn from House of the Dragon is the tragic irony that they might be coming back after 8,000 years because the Targaryens stopped the flow of baby sacrifices. And in and of itself, that's just an extension of the theory you already had. It was already theorized that they might be coming back because they did that, but that they came in the first place because of a prophecy adds another layer of irony to it. That's all point one. I, I said there were three points to the first theory. Of my whole video, that's section one of with that new new section here point two and this is what i didn't get to in my earlier video where i said this is the basic sub this is the detailed podcast version if that is the case this is all just preamble to what i'm talking about now if they're coming back because jaharis and alisan shut down the night fort and banned first night in around the year 60 after conquest why didn't we immediately see a reaction by the White Walkers when Jaehaerys banned First Night and closed down the Night Fort 240 years before Jon Snow's time? Preston's video does touch on this a little, I'll get into that, but his main focus was on Craster and his sacrifices, so let me go over that first. Recall that Craster's father was actually a member of the Night's Watch, He's a bastard of some Night's Watch commander, and there is an additional addendum to this theory that maybe the Night's Watch set up Craster in the first place. And But I, I think that doesn't necessarily need to be true. They at least found what he was doing and tolerated it. But either way, the Night's Watch knew Craster and not didn't just tolerate what he was doing, but actively promoted it. They knew what he was doing. That they were essentially shifting the baby sacrifices beyond the wall, from away from prying eyes, with a willing wildling in a desperate attempt to placate the White Walkers. And this might have stemmed the tide for a while, but it just wasn't enough. I mean, one man compared to the large-scale practice of first night across entire regions of, of the North and the rest of Seven Kingdoms, it just wasn't enough. The numbers weren't there. It, Preston's video has a lot of other charts and this whole timeline he worked out, timeline chart, going into the specifics, but the short version is that Craster has been offering baby sacrifices to the wa White Walkers since he was young for maybe the past 40 years. That he started doing this around 40 years ago, going by the ages of his daughter wives. So, Craster started something like 200 years after Jaehaerys and Alysanne. They were in the year 60 after Conquest, he started around 260 after Conquest. And Preston briefly raises the question, what was going on in that 200 year gap? And even then, Craster's sacrifices weren't enough, that they're coming back, even though he's doing that by Jon Snow's time. It, we don't have a firm answer, but... In broad strokes, I'm starting to get a feel from some vague evidence that there's a theme that keeps repeating, that, keep, that keeps pointing towards that the White Walkers have actually been active in the Far North since the Long Night, that they weren't just asleep, or more accurately, that they make cyclical reawakenings every 100 years or so. Now, the entire race as a whole might have been dormant and remained dormant for all of these 8,000 years, don't get me wrong. What I mean is that at least a handful of scouts or tomb guardians or something watching over them 
would reappear to collect baby sacrifices every hundred years. The idea is that when this stopped, those scouts woke up the rest of them. Maybe. There's a general feel for this. I'm not clear on the specifics. Maybe this active period of child sacrifice between dormancies wasn't just a one-time thing that happened in one year. Maybe it lasted a generation. Maybe it was alternating between 30 years of sacrifice and 100 years of dormancy. I'm not really sure, but let's go with 100 years. Every 100 years, they have this cycle of awakening, of some of their scouts at least, awakening from dormancy. Uh, there are a couple of examples of things like this from other stories, but the most prominent one that comes to mind, because it was a popular video game, is The Reapers from Mass Effect. Tell me in the comments if you've done it, but if you haven't played it, you're not familiar with it, it was pretty popular. In Mass Effect, there's galactic-scale civilization, humanity in the future has met other alien races and stuff, but the Reapers are this Lovecraftian cybernetic space-based race of creatures. I mean, they're the size of spaceships. Uh, they're these Lovecraftian cyborg creatures of immense power who cull all of interstellar civilization in the entire galaxy every 50,000 years. That's why they're called the Reapers. It's like this cyclical harvest where they wipe out anything capable of interstellar travel but they spare primitive races. And why is it 50,000 years? They explain, well, that's roughly the amount of time it takes all the primitive races from the last time to rebuild to the point that they have interstellar civilization. And they've been doing this for potentially millions of years. That at first they think, oh, they wiped out the civilization before us. Then they realize they've wiped out several hundred, all of galactic civilization capable of spaceflight has been killed by these things several hundred times, if not more. When you think about just how long history is, that there's um, 50,000 goes into a million 20 times, so one, one million years is 20 cycles. They might have been doing this for a billion years or something, so thousands of times they've done this. But the point is, between cullings, once they're finished, the Reapers go into dormancy. They hibernate by going into dark space, the intergalactic void, just beyond the edge of our galaxy, like still in orbit of it, but they go into the intergalactic void just beyond the edge of our galaxy, but within traveling distance. And they just go into sleep mode for 50,000 years. But they do leave one or two active reapers behind, not dormant, the active reapers as scouts, as to watch over the galaxy to make sure everything's going according to plan, that nothing develops interstellar capability too quickly, that it follows the time scale they've developed. And in, in Mass Effect 1, the, the single scout reaper that they left behind as a guardian, was a, as an observer, was called Sovereign. Uh, his real name is Nazara. But there, there's one reaper who stays behind between the main cycles, but the race as a whole is dormant, but they come cyclically. Something similar to that, or like other stuff, like Warhammer 40k, the Necrons are mostly dormant, but there's a couple of Tomb Guardians who are in active mode, guarding over the sleeping ones, that kind of thing. Does the text support the idea that the White Walkers have been coming in cycles since the Long Night? Or specific, not the race as a whole, but that their advanced scouts, like Sovereign, the Reaper Sovereign for Mass Effect, that their advanced scouts have been active and possibly collecting babies in a cycle every hundred years or so. Preston Jacobs' own video, briefly, he did touch on this, and he did speculate for one slide that it's tantalizingly possible. It, now, I had forgotten about this entirely that I remembered the big legends, like the Knight's King, the 13th Lord Commander, the Knight's Watch. But Preston listed all of these off, that there's a big info dump in the third novel, where Bran Stark and his group are headed to the Night Fort, and while they're camped, he lists off not one, not two, but eight different legends about the Night Fort that Old Nan told him. Those half-remembered nursery rhyme, old legends, old Nan passed on, that you realize there's a kernel of truth. 
And they vary between them, but there's a certain enough degree of overlap that you get a theme from them. Now, I'd forgotten one of the most important ones because it doesn't have a proper name. It's just called The Thing That Came In The Night. So you didn't have a proper name, I, I didn't think of it for years, but he reminded me of that in his video from five years ago. All of these uh, eight stories share a theme of children being offered up to the wall or to monsters at the wall or being sent there and sealed alive in ice to guard it. The thing that came the night really caught my eye because that story explicitly talks about a demon which comes every hundred years in cycles and steals away the little apprentice boys serving at the wall and the end of the story is when the demon reappeared a century later, the boys appeared behind it as ghosts dragging chains and in its thrall. That seems like a pretty big hint, that they come cyclically every hundred years. There is a story that actually says they come once every hundred years to collect children. And combine this with the story of the Knight's King, not the Night King, the 13th Lord Commander who allegedly fell into the thrall of a White Walker woman or a woman who was sent by them, took over the watch through sorcery and was conducting human sacrifices to them, to the point that the Stark Kings and the First King Beyond the Wall had to unite to take him down. And, you know, maybe those human sacrifices weren't executions, but baby sacrifices or something. But consider that the Night King is... The Knight's King, 13th Lord Commander is said to have rebelled exactly 100 years after the wall was built. He was offering up human sacrifices. And also, that ties in with the story of the thing that came in the night comes every 100 years. So Preston thought this, and I'm just really looking at it with more focus. Yeah, it does appear George R. R. Martin is dropping some hints that White Walker scouts come to accept offerings of male babies, not in a continuous process, but roughly every hundred years. Maybe more, maybe not, but that's pretty big. The question becomes, for point three now, when the Targaryens shut down the night fort and first night around 60 after conquest, maybe the White Walkers were just in another dormancy period in the middle of one of their hibernation cycles, because they only come every hundred years to collect the sacrifices. Then again, maybe not, because some people theorize that, well, Martin only mentioned the Shivers Plague in Fire and Blood, but he mentions, like, the year after they shut down First Night and the Night Fort, this severe winter, famine winter, hit Westeros from the north, and this super plague called the Shivers came. But then again, they said the Shivers came from the east, it started in the Free City, so maybe the plague wasn't them, but the, the winter might have been them, but maybe that's something their scouts called down. I don't know whether they control the winters or not. But at the very least, okay, maybe there wasn't an immediate reaction because they were in the middle of a dormancy period. Point three, even if they have those dormancy cycles of a hundred years, how do we account for a 240-year gap? They would have been due to reappear since then. Are the cycles regular enough that you can tune a watch to them? That is a question, and I don't have a firm answer. That is it always a hundred years? Is it like thirty years on, then a hundred years off? How long do these last exactly? Is it more like every hundred and fifty to two hundred years are these cycles? If it's irregular, I don't need to explain it. But if it is regular, how do I explain it? What lines up with that? Are there things we saw in that two hundred year gap between Jaehaerys banning it and Craster? that seem like the White Walkers, or at least their scouts, were rousing to activity beyond the wall and upset they weren't getting baby sacrifices. I'm going to present you with two scenarios. The first one is, let's assume the maximum scenario, that when Jaehaerys banned it around 58, 60 after conquest, the maximum amount of time, that that was just as they were entering a new hundred-year dormancy period, right? So the latest we would expect them to be doing something is 100 years, 99 to 100 years after that, if he just missed the last baby pickup. What was happening in the 150s after conquest? 
Well, Aegon III died in 158 after conquest, and the last dragon died in the year 153 after conquest. But that makes no sense. If the White Walkers were due for a return in the late 150s, wouldn't the death of the last dragon mark the perfect time to return? And we don't really hear about, like, wildlings being driven south or anything, so no, I don't think the last dorm... If you're thinking, well, maybe if they banned it in 58 AC, maybe the last dormancy period, maybe the last baby pickup was, was 55 AC, so we wouldn't expect them to do anything for 100 years. That's the, that's the ceiling. That's the maximum. Nothing happened in the 150s that would really line up with that. They didn't do anything. If anything, the death of the last dragon would have encouraged them, but they didn't. So no, it had to be something before that was the last baby pickup. Before the 150s. Working backwards. You would expect the symptom of a White Walker burst of activity to be them driving the wildlings south. That this is what Mance Raider did. That Mance Raider is uniting all the wildlings out of their common fear of that the White Walkers are returning and they're fleeing south. Okay. So it stands to reason that the last time there was a king beyond the wall uniting an attempted invasion of the south of the wall, maybe they were driven by White Walkers or their scouts in a burst of activity. The last king beyond the wall was Raymond Redbeard, whose invasion was in 226 after conquest, almost exactly a hundred years after the Dance of the Dragons. So I, I know I'm working backward here, but who is the king beyond the wall before Raymond Redbeard? Because they don't happen regularly. The, the one before Raymond, as far as we know from the books, there hadn't been a king beyond the wall in at least a thousand years. So it's not like there was any other king beyond the wall during the Targaryen era. This is the only other one was Raymond Redbeard in 226 AC. And maybe, okay, if he was driven by White Walkers coming 220 to 226 after conquest in that region... And it might not be exactly 100, it might be 98, it might be under 3, whatever, but in the region of a century, one century before Raymond Redbeard was the Dance of the Dragons. So, maybe this is this other burst of activity they had. That they were, the theory I'm presenting now is, maybe they were due for baby sacrifices once every 100 years, lining up to the 20s. 220s, 120s, and the 20s of the Conquest, and going before that for thousands of years, even before the Aegon's Conquest dating system. But if that's the case, just putting this out as a hypothetical, the last baby pickup would have been in the 20s when Aegon the Conqueror was in the south. He didn't go to the Night's Watch for anything. That would And that would have been 40 years before Jaehaerys banned First Night and shut down the Night Ford. So let's play with this. That the last baby pickup was in the twenties. Forty years later, Jaehaerys bans First Night, shuts down the Night Fort. Then sixty to seventy-ish years after that, in the one twenties, the White Walkers were due for another baby pickup, and were surprised that it didn't happen. And again, this could have taken a couple of years for them to rouse and get annoyed about it, but maybe even five years before the dance actually began. But maybe they're entering this burst of activity again, roughly timed to this. And I'm, I'm tying so much of this too that Raymond Redbeard rose a hundred years after this, and there's evidence they come in hundred year cycles. But consider, Raymond Redbeard's invasion will happen during one of the later Duncan Egg prequel novellas that hasn't been printed yet. And it is possible that Martin has always intended to give more info about why the White Walkers come back in a later Duncan Egg, and how well the Raymond is being driven by his fear of the White Walker scouts are roused because they don't have sacrifices. Also consider that in his later life, Egg, Aegon V, became obsessed with hatching new dragons. Perhaps as if so he learned something that made him feel he had a dire need of them? Something that happens in a later Duncan Egg, and obviously I can't prove that, but 
I think there's a link between the timing of, they keep saying every hundred years, Raymond Redbeard, Dance of the Dragons, and this lines up that why didn't they immediately react in 60 after conquest to Jaehaerys? They were in the middle of a dormancy period, like 40 to 50 years into it. That's the second scenario, and I think that's surprisingly plausible. Not necessarily provable, but plausible. Well, going by this theory, then what happened? Well, Raymond Redbeard's invasion came and went, and after the second time, the White Walkers realized they're never going to give us baby sacrifices again. And again, this is fuzzy to me, but if Craster started sacrificing around 260, and Redbeard was around the 220s, it's like a 20-year gap, but maybe they just gradually, maybe he wasn't the only wildling doing that, but worked up to a point where they were desperately trying to get some wildlings like Craster to make up the numbers. Wasn't enough. We'll see on that, but that's what is starting to line up for me. If, and I know, I'm just getting this out there in case Season 2 actually mentions they come every hundred years, and we were due for one, and well, we were in a dormancy period. And this leads to my fourth and final point. Why are the White Walkers coming back so late? And why wouldn't they have come back after Raymond Redbeard, or after all the dragons died? I think their return is explicitly linked in the main novels to the decline and fall of House Targaryen. That I don't think it was one thing, it was a gradual stepwise process of, reawak of reawakening that, let's assume that at least their scouts wake up right before the Dance of the Dragons, but there's no sacrifices. Why didn't the scouts rouse the, the rest of them? Because the Targaryens were at the height of their power with the most dragons they'd ever had. A few dragons even survived, like there were four living ones after the end of the dance, but the White Walkers aren't stupid, unthinking robots. They're smart enough to accept baby sacrifices rather than launch a potentially risky full-scale invasion. They have some wherewithal to take the easy path. That To wait them out, more, more accurately, to wait them out. To wait out danger of, look, we'll take some baby sacrifices now, we'll spare you in this generation, maybe we'll come back when you're weaker, we don't know. But the White Walkers aren't stupid, they know how vulnerable they are to dragon fire, that their, their zombies are are very combustible, that they are vulnerable to Valyrian steel, they fear the Targaryens, they fear the effect the dragons can have on their armies. They even spelled it out in Season 1, that the, the power of dragons can stop them. So I think these White Walker scouts might have been making probing attacks for a while. Yes, like what Sovereign was doing in Mass Effect 1, where these are probing attacks to undermine their enemies, but nothing direct yet. Not, we're going to rouse our entire race from dormancy, but little things they might have been manipulating this whole time, like uh, uh, Preston mentioned this, that there was a rebellion on Skagos Island from like 190 to 210 after conquest in that region, and Skagos is one of the places close to the wall that would be like, we'll be first hit, we've been giving them, Roos mentions they're one of the places that still does first night, maybe because they're afraid of the White Walkers because they're so close to the north. Little things that they might have been pushing, or the Raymond Redbeard's invasion, fleeing them, that kind of thing. But when, if they woke up around the 120s, the Targaryens were at their height. Even post-dance, there were still living dragons. They might have thought, let's wait this out. A hundred years later, Raymond Redbeard's invasion is stimulated by White Walkers. Why didn't they invade in force then? They might have still feared the Targaryens out of the fear that they could potentially hatch new dragons. That they're, they're cautious, they're not stupid. Because even after the, the dragons went extinct in the 150s, they were still actively trying to hatch new ones. They still had eggs, and they treated it like they can come back, they can come back. You know, from the perspective of history, they didn't know 150 years later there still won't be any that, oh, the last one died. Oh, we still have eggs. Maybe in five to ten years we can hatch a new one. But it's kind of hit or miss. What this leads up to, in terms of major events, and think out of universe, what are things George R. R. Martin stressed are important? The tragedy at Summerhall. 
which we don't know exactly what happened. It's going to be the last Dunkin' Egg adventure where, as old men, Aegon V, Egg, tries to hatch new dragon eggs, and he's so desperate to do it, whatever spell they do goes wrong, leads to a massive fire that guts the palace, kills him and Dunk and a lot of other people. But this major story event, which is shrouded in secrecy, because Martin said it's plot important, why would this be so important to the main of Song of Ice and Fire novels, not just to Dunk and Egg? Though there's the tragedy at Summerhall that up through only 40 years ago when the tragedy at Summerhall happened, the Targaryens thought they could still hatch new eggs. The White Walkers probably feared they could hatch new eggs too. So they didn't make their move when Raymond Redbeard happened. If, you know, there's the potential for this. We should wait them out. After that, I don't know if they even had eggs after that, but this ties in, all this ties in with the life of Rhaegar Targaryen, Jon Snow's secret father. He was born the night of the tragedy of Summerhall at Summerhall at, at, amidst the ashes. And I think it was a two-step thing. That first, the tragedy at Summerhall wiped out a lot of their eggs, a lot of the people who knew how to hatch them. But maybe they feared, maybe the White Walkers feared Rhaegar might be able to hatch new ones even then. Maybe he still had some eggs, or at least they reunited under the Targaryens who had potentially the knowledge of this. It was enough. There was enough magic knowledge that Rhaegar read in some ancient scroll about the White Walker prophecy. After the fall of the Targaryens, like, Robert Baratheon would never have read this ancient magic scroll that belonged to the Targaryens with the prophecy of the dragon's return. Whatever secret knowledge the Targaryens could use to their advantage against the White Walkers apparently didn't survive their fall, but was enough to motivate Rhaegar to find three heads of the dragon, to become a warrior, to be driven to, I need to make a third head of the dragon, that he was trying to make dragon riders. He needed Jon Snow as a dragon rider, as a son, the third head of the dragon, something like that. But even after the tragedy at Summerhall, there was enough Targaryen knowledge of these prophecies and what could hurt the White Walkers that it, even when Rhaegar was alive, they still had pause. But then you had the fall of the Targaryens. Rhaegar is dead, the Mad King is dead, and the Targaryen dynasty as a whole has been overthrown. I don't think they had any dragon eggs left in King's Landing or something. And anyone who could potentially have the knowledge to hatch them, that life for life requires magic ritual, they're gone. Now consider that the White Walkers don't just come back like a switch, even in the main novels, that it's a gradual build-up. They said for the past couple of years the wildlings have been getting more and more desperate because the White Walkers have been growing their army slowly but incrementally. And it took Mance Raider a couple of years to unite all of their tribes for this one big push to the south. So how long do you think Mance Raider was doing that and consider he was doing it in reaction to the White Walkers and that in the books it was 15 years ago? It seems, just based on Mance Raider's activities, the timeline of Mance, that... The White Walkers started coming back in force, abandoning the Hundred Year Cycle around the time Robert's Rebellion ended and the overthrow of the Targaryens. That's what I think changed. And it, it could have been stepwise. It could have been a bit more active after the tragedy of Summer Hall and then really active after Robert's Rebellion. But what changed is the Targaryens were now completely dead, they thought. They were overthrown. There were no more dragon eggs or people the knowledge to hatch them in Westeros, and they must have spies the way that, or, or magical green sight to see this, the way the children of the forest would keep tabs through the Weirwood network or something, and sending dreams. The, the dark version of that is like them sending dreams to people like Euron. The thing they didn't factor on is that a Targaryen would survive outside of Westeros where they weren't looking. Daenerys was in the east or that she'd managed to acquire dragon eggs and hatch them. That escaped their notice. And because they weren't aware of that, they thought, yay, the Targaryens are gone, there will never even be dragon eggs or dragons again, and started building up for a major attack right after Robert's Rebellion ended. That is why I think that how I think this timeline works out. And you could even accuse me of this being too formulaic, but like Martin said, you can't just subvert expectations. At a certain point, major plot elements will start to line up with each other in a sensible story. 
So is it too obvious? Is it not sensible enough? But my theory is that maybe as late as the tragedy of Summerhall, they abandoned the hundred-year cycle of their scouts. Before that, they were coming every hundred years. So when Jaehaerys banned First Night and closed the Night Fort, it was the middle of a dormancy period. That it started in the 20s, year 50 to 60 was dormant. But then by the time of 2020s, Raymond Redbeard's wildling invasion was driven by White Walker scouts demanding baby sacrifices again, but not getting any. And a hundred years before, the last king beyond the wall in a thousand years. There were no other ones, and the only other one, Mance, was also driven by the White Walkers. I think Raymond was driven by the White Walkers out of fear of them the way Mance was, and a hundred years before Raymond was the Dance of the Dragons. And we get... There wasn't a full king beyond the wall, but there was this wildling leader called Silas the Grim, who led a decent-sized wildling horde south. And maybe just because it was a really bad winter and they were starving up there, which seemed to be what they, the reason was in Fire and Blood, but there's unrest among the wildlings. There could be stuff going on. We could see the White Walkers waking up for the first time alongside the Dance of the Dragons, this is the first time since the ban went into effect that they've their scouts have woken up after a hundred years and gone, there aren't any baby sacrifices for us. And they'll be really pissed off. And there might be stuff going at the wall with this. So what is something new that House of the Dragon could do that isn't just, hey, let's show them for the sake of showing them, but having a reason for it? Based on the hundred year cycles, I think this is the first time they're going to wake up around this time, the 120s to 130s, and be annoyed there aren't any baby sacrifices. We'll see what plays out in season two. Now, I have a follow up video to this, also audio only, which is just a really detailed reaction to a theory thing that I told you after this, if you haven't already, watch part three of Preston's video series where he talks about the timeline of what do we know about what the White Walkers were doing between the Long Night and Craster's time for the past centuries. Specifically part three. Watch the whole thing, but if nothing else, watch part three. My next video is going to react to part four of that, where he talks about really specific theories about why was Craster inbreeding bloodlines and things, and what implications this has for the Wildlings as a whole. But that's just a theory thing. I don't think House of the Dragon would even need to touch on it. But it just another idea that came to me. So stick around for the next part of this and check out his videos.